Hello, hello. Hey guys. So yeah, I'm back at it. Second show. Woo! <laughs> and I am just so happy to be here, you guys. Um, my name is Deanna, and this show, thanks for all the applause, <laughs> this show that um, I am doing is going to change the world because I want everybody to see something that I think we haven't looked at the way we need to, okay? The show is Laughter After, and it is brought to you to highlight the triumph, the hope, and the laughter after trauma, and to just bring some lightness to a heavy topic. And I'm not going to take a long time talking about this because I have an amazing guest today. Her name is Jana Shelfer. And Jana is, in my opinion, the, one of the most impressive people. Hey, Jay. She is a three. Hey, Jana, you, you're, you're not um, muted when you're on stage. Do you want to mute yourself for just a second? Um, wait, I might be able to help you real quick. Um, cause I want to give you a proper in introduction before I bring you up to video. So Jana is a three-time Paralympian. Okay. Um, and a gold medalist. She also was a radio personality for a long time, uh, in her local area in Florida and a morning show. So people know her. <laughs> And uh, she is also a life coach. She's been through lots of different modalities and trainings. And she is half of the Living Lucky brand, where they really try and bring to you every day a way to spin your life positive. So I'm going to bring Jana up to video so that we can start chatting. Let's see. Mm -hmm. See, she's got that, so she can, there we go. Okay, let me unmute you. I had muted you. Hang on one second. <laughs> um, there you go. Can you unmute yourself? Okay, there you go. I couldn't unmute you. I can mute you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you were screaming for Jason, I'm, and I'm like. I'm like yelling at my husband. I don't know if you all heard that. <laughs> You're like, it's oh, right. she's so positive. I'm like, hey, Jay. <laughs> That's all right. You know what? We'll, we'll get to hear his side in a minute. All right. So just a few housekeeping rules, you guys. Um, you can um, leave a message. If you look at that little hamburger on the left-hand side, you can uh, leave a message um, by reacting. And in that little hamburger, you can look in there and see, uh, the transcript of the show. There's some other actions you can take in there. Just don't leave. Um, <laughs> and in a minute, I'm going to fill in this fortune cookie with a couple of links, uh, so that you guys can know how to con uh, connect with us further. So let me real quick, just welcome everybody in the audience. Let's see. Thanks for all the support. I got rock steady in here. Amy, Kathleen, Sonia, Diane, uh, Ted, Istro, Woody, Jason, uh, the other half of the Living Lucky brand, my girl, Wendy, Dr. Laura. Okay, uh, so we're going to get right into it, right? So, Jana, I want you to start wherever you feel. I don't want to dwell on the trauma, but I think people need to have some background. And then we'll talk about how you've kind of come through it into different things and the positive, the spin positive part of it. So you go, take it away, talk. Okay, well, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm O for two because I, I wasn't planning on showing you my whole body, so I'm actually only dressed from the top up. <laughs> but I am a paraplegic, so I have my yoga pants on. So I'm like, I will show you, I am a paraplegic. My story is very, very visual because when I was 15 years old, I had a lot going for me. I was very, very athletic. I was a baton twirler and I was just reaching that age where I had boys calling and I was popular. I was very, very smart. Things were going well for me and in fact, that year, it was my freshman year of high school, 
I was the feature baton twirler in my high school band and our band traveled to the Air Force Academy and we were featured there, which was really fun. It was one of my favorite memories that year. I was the feature baton twirler at the Air Force Academy and I can remember throwing my baton up and all of the cadets, you know, holding their hankies up and yelling for me. I remember that year our basketball team went to state and I actually was a freshman, but because my dad was a coach growing up, I grew up playing sports and sports it was it was always very very pop or very very important in my family and health and fitness and so I was lucky enough to be on the varsity team my freshman year. It all changed. My life changed in an instant on May 23rd, 1990, which seems like an eternity ago, but it was the very last day of school and I hopped in a car with a friend of mine. We were headed to the lake after school to celebrate the last day of school. And as we came over some railroad tracks to get to the lake, because I grew up in a small town in Kansas, so it was a rural road, we fishtailed on the dirt road and my friend lost control of the car and we had a very minor car accident. And when I say minor, we fishtailed and the back end of our car ended up on the side embankment. It, it seemed very, very small. I didn't have a bruise on me. However, when that happened, my back twisted just enough to where all of a sudden I couldn't feel or move anything from the chest down. And I was told I would never walk or feel anything again. And at age 15, that's a hard pill to swallow. I remember being in intensive care and for about eight weeks straight, I can remember looking at the hospital ceiling and just wailing. And I, I actually had so many people come to visit me and I would put on this facade because I was a performer. And as they would come visit me, I would try to make them feel comfortable around me. And then as soon as everybody would leave at, during the day, at night, I would stay awake and I would just cry because I thought this is the worst thing that could possibly happen to a 15 year old girl. I am never gonna walk again. After about eight weeks in intensive care, I was flown out to Colorado to a rehab hospital and a funny thing happened. <laughs> the universe is always working in our favor because I was waiting for my physical therapy appointment and I was sitting in the lobby and a quadriplegic was also sitting there and he asked me to scratch his nose for him. And when he did that, I thought, ooh, that's gross. Like, why would I scratch your nose? That's just disgusting. And, and he was like, and he come was on, a little older, right? Yeah, he was like, come on, Blondie, scratch my nose for me. And, you know, I'm a nice person. So I, I reached up and I scratched his nose. He was, he was paralyzed from the neck down. And as I did that, he said to me, you have no idea how lucky you are. And immediately I went from feeling like this is the worst thing that ever happened to me to there was just a subtle mind shift. And I started asking myself the question, how lucky am I? How lucky am I? And all of a sudden the focus went from what I had lost to I started to appreciate what I still had. So I feel like so many times in life we get stuck because we concentrate on what we don't have instead of keeping the focus on what we do have. 
Yeah. So let me let me pause for a second. So in in that place, because still, you know, you're 15, mm-hmm. and 15 is well. I don't I don't know. I think 15 is a rough age if there's nothing going on outside of whatever happens in a teenager's life, which is let's just act like there's never nothing going on in a teenager's life. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, like. It, you, life is already kind of like crazy and you're in your head and you're very self, um, not absorbed, but um, you're, you're looking for acceptance, right? Mm-hmm. At that age, you want to fit in, you want to feel whatever, part of your peer groups, all of that kind of stuff. So in this, I get that there's some awareness that happens in this situation and you actually kind of get a chance to see like, oh wait, maybe I'm not as you know, unlucky as I thought, Mm -hmm. but there had to be like, how was the support through there? Not only from your parents, but from your, from your friends, what was the support looking like? So, okay. So there were two extremes, extremely supportive in that my community rallied around me I had so much support in that people wanted to almost over help me and people thought they were doing everything they could to be there for me. And um, people didn't know how to help me. I had never known anyone with a disability. I didn't really understand that immediately people viewed me differently. So let me just Mm -hmm. tell you that first day back to school after I'm a paraplegic, that was a hard pill to swallow. And I almost want to cry just thinking about it because I can go there immediately. I was a cheerleader. I was a cheerleader. And that first day back to school, we had a football game. And I thought, you know what? I'm a cheerleader. So I'm gonna put on my cheerleading outfit. Now, I remember specifically coming out of my room in my cheerleading outfit, and I thought my sister was going to choke on her cereal. (laughs) She was in first grade, and she was like, oh my gosh, Joan is going to school in her cheerleading outfit in a wheelchair. (laughs) First day back, I, I remember just trying to put on a brave face. And I had this I had this neon yellow wheelchair, same color as my shirt. And I remember just putting on this brave face saying, okay, Jana, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And I remember opening the door and it was so hard because I had left that school as being the baton twirler, athlete, popular girl that the boys wanted to take out on a date. And I was coming back as there was a different look in people's eyes. There was a different look. They were seeing me differently. And there was also a disconnect because my body was different for me, but my inner identity hadn't changed. Mm. So there was a lot of psychology going on that I didn't understand at age 15. And I'm not sure if I completely conceptualize it all still. Like people ask me, you know, when you dream, do you dream standing, sitting? I I seriously 
feel that I am a, a spirit and this is my my body. I and and whether I see myself disabled or not, I I really can't even answer that. So there, there's an identity crisis mm -hmm. going on and, and it's an identity crisis in the way others are viewing me, the way I'm viewing myself. And, and there's just, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. It affect, it affected my family. It, it was very complex. Yeah, so I can imagine that. What is one tip or one piece of advice that you would give to people who uh, find themselves in a situation where they need to be supportive to be able to do that in a way that is actually and truly supportive? You know, like that's really, truly something that is going to benefit. I, I do feel like for people of trauma now, I'm just going to generalize this a little bit, but almost anybody that I talk to, and I, again, I'm not a doctor, but I deal in this arena, right? And almost anybody that I talk to has a point to make about not being seen or treated differently, where they just want, um, you know, like for somebody to look at them and not go like, Oh, poor thing, right? And whatever, for whatever it was, and I and I come across this in, in across the board. I've dealt with it with my daughter and in, in her situation. Um, I know people who have gotten illnesses who have felt like this. Like, hey, can we just not change all the dynamics of our relationship? So, what what is what is one thing you would say about that? I think everyone is different. And so just truly being, oh. truly being present and just authentically listening. I, I really think just listening. And, and I think that is, is a good tip for not only people with disabilities, but people with any situation, if you can just be present and really listen and try to just meet people where they're at. And again, that's different for every situation. And I know that's kind of a broad generalization, but I just, I just know for myself, you know, I was a teenager and hormones were kicking in. And sometimes I felt like nobody understands because nobody is in this situation. Mm -hmm. And my parents were, were very good. They were very good at saying, you know what? We need to get Jana at maybe some sports camps, at some wheelchair sports camps so that she can be around with disabilities and maybe start seeing other people who are dealing with the same thing that she's going through. Okay. I like that. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's jump forward a little bit into the future because at some point you go from that and what you're dealing with there into the Olympics. And I yeah. think people will love to hear what you did in the Olympics. What, what was the arena? What was the sport? So I started playing wheelchair sports pretty early on. In fact, in the rehab hospital, they immediately started saying, you know what, let's, let's start introducing you to sports. And, and then again, my parents, when, when they saw, you know what, Jana maybe needs to be around some, some other kids with disabilities or maybe some even adults with disabilities, they started sending me to sports camps in the mm -hmm. summers. And from there, I, I started going to the university of Illinois to, in the summers and, and the coaches there were like, this girl can, can play some basketball. And I, I got a scholarship to go there to play basketball. They had a collegiate team. 
And next thing I know, I'm being invited to the Paralympic tryouts, the USA team. And I just, I just kept making the cut. And it was yeah. one of those things where I had the skills and it was, it was literally just learning to, to use the, the wheelchair. Right. As an extension, right? A new yeah. extension, a new way to maneuver. So you did that you, and you, and you showed up at the Olympics three times, right? Yes. Yeah, so I was on the 96 team. We won the, the bronze medal that year. That was in Atlanta, Georgia. And in between the Paralympics, I was on World Cup teams. I, I mean, I've been to so many different countries, not only in basketball, but I played wheelchair tennis. I've done hand cycling. I've done skiing. Um, like I just, I feel so blessed because it opened mm. up so many different avenues. And, and mind you, I was a small town girl from Kansas. Like I had never even before my accident, I had never even been on an airplane. So this was something yeah. where, you know, it, it opened up many, many doors for me. But in 2000, our, our, the Paralympics were in Australia and we ended up getting fifth that year. And then in 2004, we won the gold medal. Nice. nice. I love it. So let's just go through some things real quick. After that, we wound up in radio, right? Yes. I love it. Jason's here too. Yeah. Yeah. We wound up you know, in radio after that. Yeah, so you met I, Jason somewhere along the way. <laughs> my life, my life has been awesome. My life has been really, really great because part of wheelchair sports, I started going to schools and I started educating kids about wheelchair sports and disability mm -hmm. awareness, and I started speaking. Mm -hmm. When I would go overseas, I would start speaking about, hey, this is what wheelchair sports can do, and these are the benefits. And when we would do the Paralympics, you know, a lot of people, especially when I was in the Paralympics, people didn't know about the Paralympics. So we mm -hmm. would educate and we would talk. So that started my speaking career. And I had gone to school for journalism. And so then it just was kind of a natural progression for me to start going in that, that avenue as a career. When, mm -hmm. I, when I got the gold medal, I thought, well, it's time to maybe start settling down a little bit. So I, the natural progression was to fall in love. I met Mr. Jason who's in the audience and Who I'm trying to bring up to the stage right now, if we can manage that. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. All right, Jason, I'm going to bring you on camera in just a second. If you can mute for just one second. Great. And then we're going to bring you up on camera in just one second. Jana, finish with you. Yeah. Were and then I, I was lucky enough to land a job at, as a radio personality and it was, it's talk radio. So we would talk for four hours a day and we would talk about everything from politics to our personal stories, our opinions, all about life. The only, the only thing about my job that is kind of a little interesting tidbit is they asked me when I accepted the job as a radio personality to not mention the fact that I am disabled. So I mm. actually became a radio personality here in Orlando for 12 years and I never once mentioned on the air that I have a disability. Yeah, oh, interesting. Yeah, and that's kind of, um, it, it, it kind of adds to my story because during that time, social media evolved. And when social media evolved <clears throat> and I started becoming popular and people would come out to meet me, the first thing they would say is, oh my gosh, what's wrong with you? What's <laughs> wrong with you? 
right? So What's wrong? The, the, the second thing they would say is you're so much smarter in person. <laughs> Which I'm like, oh, great. I don't know if that's a good thing. But the first thing is what's wrong with you? And right. as, as we study psychology, we all know our subconscious is picking up everything. Mm -hmm. And there's a talk track. There's an inner dialogue that's happening. And when we hear things like what's wrong with you, that seeps in. And, and so that starts to, starts to groove. It starts mm -hmm. to get into those narrow pathways. And, yeah. and so then if you, if you know my story, I did go into a depression. And part of that is, I started asking myself, what's wrong with me? Well, your brain will always prove you right, which is why it's very, very important to always ask yourself empowering questions. So this is Jason. Let's bring him up here. Um, Jason is, I'm going to say the other half. I'm not calling him the better half. Yes. We're gonna leave Jana in the better half position <laughs> because what they've done in, in all of this, <laughs> is they have so let let's just let's just hear how you guys kind of wound up together and then what you're creating right now with the living lucky brand and and just as a side note guys in the audience i know a couple of people have asked to come up we're going to let some people uh come up and ask some questions in just a minute let's just get through this um first half i, I see you deborah um and I know you have some stuff to say, and I have a feeling that you're probably a little bit in this arena. So we're going to talk to you in just a second. But let's let's hear how you guys got together, and then tell us about you know your mission right now and what you guys are doing. Either one of you, both. Jason, go ahead. Yeah, I can tell. It's so my sister and Jan, one of Jana's friends worked at the same law firm in Tallahassee, Florida, and Jan and I both lived in Orlando. I was a workaholic at the time and worked roughly 16 hours a day. And Jana traveled all around the world. She had literally just got back from the Olympics and her friend was complaining that she would never meet anyone because she travels all the time. And my sister was saying he'll never meet anyone because he works all the time. And I'd gotten so happy with myself that I was like, I'm never getting married. I love me. I'm good like this. I'm, I'm conquering the world. And Jana and I got stuck together for four hurricanes in 2004. And no power. All she kept in her refrigerator at the time because she traveled was nail polish. And I'm like. <laughs> Jana, you should unmute. because Oh, like and Totino's pizza rolls in the freezer. It's, and it was totally um, just an interesting experience to be stuck with somebody for 10 days and have you have Totino's pizza rolls that are thawing out and nail polish. And then in her cabinets were literally like the kitchen cabinets had clothes in them. Like her winter clothes were in the kitchen. <laughs> but, after, but after being together, I was like, we got through with that. And I said, you know what, this, this woman is amazing. And I never in my life want to spend a moment without her. So that's beautiful. Jana, unmute. So then, okay, so you guys are together, right? Never never to be parted. I love it. Um, so tell us about the, the, um, the living lucky, because this is really the part. This is the part where you go, okay, all of this stuff is, right? And not to minimize anything that you've been through, but I feel like after these last couple of years, a lot of us are in touch with what it feels like to go through some sort of trauma and anxiety, right? I think it's safe to say that. So tell us what is living lucky? How are you spinning this positive and, and go with that? So our story is very, <laughs> I, I, I hope this is entertaining and valuable to everybody. Our story, I started hearing a voice. I was on the radio and I loved my job, don't get me wrong, but I, as I mentioned, I did not mention that I was in a wheelchair. And so for the first five years, I loved it. I absolutely loved it because since I was 15, I'd been saying the prayer, oh, I just want people to see me for me and not my disability. 
Mm-hmm. But as as time went on and as social media started coming out and people started, you know, kind of seeing me there, it started feeling like I wasn't being completely authentic with who I am. And it also felt like, you know, there's a lot more power in my story in being visual and getting out and speaking And I also started at that time hearing a voice inside my soul. And the voice was saying, Jana, there's something bigger and better for you. And I didn't want to hear it. Like I I seriously did not want to hear it. And so I kept just kind of not listening to myself. I don't know if you've ever done that. And the more that I just tried to ignore myself, my body started to break down. And I started to get sick. I started Mm -hmm. to have allergies. I started to have panic attacks. I started to not be able to sleep at night. I started to, right before we would go on the radio, I was in the bathroom, literally not being able to breathe and turning flush and having heart rate palpitations you had an orgasm in the bathroom yeah i would call jason i'd be like i don't know what's happening (laughs) and it was to jason it was my it was (laughs) there was i was living incongruent that my soul was trying to speak to me that's what was Mm -hmm. happening And long story short, I went to Jason and I said, you know what? I feel like I'm having a midlife crisis and I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what to do. And, and we ended up going on safari in Africa and I, I don't know how much time we have, but while we were in Africa, we had an encounter with an elephant. And I love this story. You have time to tell this. We can take another five minutes or ten, five or so minutes before we um, have questions. Jason, go ahead. Why don't you tell it? So we're about two and a half, three weeks into the safari and we're into the Serengeti National Forest. And our driver stops in the middle of the road and says, look ahead. And there was a row of elephants like way off in the distance. They're so small you could barely see them. They were trunk to tail, trunk to tail. And Jana goes, Eustace, where are they going? Eustace was the driver's name. He goes, I don't know, but they're going somewhere very special. Well, long story short, the next morning, I woke up super early to go into the bush again with the driver. And Jana's like, I'm tired. I'm, I'm just going to take some Jana time. But as soon as the sun started coming up, the, all the camp guards came out and they're like, Jana Banana, don't move. You're in extreme danger. Well, Jana uh-uh. around and just wait to perish in a tent in the middle of Africa. But she, uh, are you wanting to come in? Anyway, she opened the, she ran over to the door in her chair and opened it up. And there was literally a baby elephant with the mama right behind it, six feet in front of her. And they locked eyes. And the way she describes it is everything just stood still. And she could hear her essential self speaking to her saying, hey, it's time. You have to make the move. And she, when I got back, she said, I'm going back. When we get back, I'm going to quit my job. And I said, awesome. Yeah, awesome, cool, but it it led to I went into a deep depression. Is what happened. <laughs> yeah, that happened too. Shortly after, bygone. Said that, that that little part happened too. But yeah, when you came out, what made you come out of the tent? Because Jason broke up a little bit, but they're saying, "Oh my God, you're in danger!" But you said, "I need to see." It so- felt. It felt like a presence I had never felt before. It Mm -hmm. felt spiritual. And I was not a spiritual person at that time. I was not spiritual at all, but there felt like a presence. And it felt like a connection that I had. And it, it felt like that elephant was coming to speak to me. And when I made eye contact it felt like that elephant was telling me, believe, believe in yourself, believe that voice and, and go for it. Cause there's something bigger and better for you. 
And I cannot explain it any other way, but I had never felt an energy like that before in my entire life. And so I quit my job and I had no rationale, no, I mean, I just went in and said, I'm leaving. And, and when people said, why, why are you leaving? I said, well, you know what? I had kind of a, a an awakening <laughs> with an elephant in the bush. And then, and then I started to feel like, oh my gosh, you know what? Maybe I've gone a little crazy. Like maybe, maybe I've gone crazy. And then when I quit my job, I told Jason, I said, you know what, what I felt there, something is, is something big is going to happen because I know what I felt. I know what I felt there. I know. Mm -hmm. And then when nothing happened, I started to doubt myself. And I don't know if any of you have felt this, but it's like all of those limiting beliefs start coming up and it's doubt and it's fear and it's, oh my gosh, what have I done? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's literally all of those <sighs> emotions. <laughs> it's the limiting beliefs where in life coaching, you know, that we talk mm -hmm. to people. Uh, it, I mean, I have, I have fought through all of them now and I have dug through all of this introspection and the journey that I have gone on gone through in the last well it's it's been a it's been a seven year journey for me and it has been the darkest and yet most beautiful seven years of my life because when I left my job which was also my creative outlet it was my family. I mean, we talked for four hours a day. When you talk for four hours a day, you have a connection with your colleagues. They are your friends. They are your family. I had rapport with the city of Orlando. I had an identity there. Do you know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was more than a job for me. It was my financial. It was my it was my everything. It was my life. And I sometimes, like Lao Tzu says, you have to let go of who you are so you can become who you might be. And there was literally a grieving process. And while I was grieving that old identity, kind of like I did when I was 15 years old, grieving the able-bodied Jana, while I was mm -hmm. grieving this Jana that was on the radio and Jana Banana, I, my marriage fell apart. Like it, it literally was everything. It, my entire mm -hmm. life fell apart, which that's what happens. But now. And it's funny how you say, because I think that things come like that. Like people. Uh, look at the things that they go through and go, oh, you know, oh, I'm past that. But there are things in life that sometimes come up over and over again. And it's not that you have to dwell on it. Sometimes you wind up in the situation you wound up in. And maybe it is a two-year depression and that's what it is. Um, and sometimes it comes up in a phase, you know, whether it's, you know, you meet somebody, you get married, you have a kid, whatever. And these things bring in a new phase in your life. And that new phase triggers a reemergence of, of whatever that you now have to, you know, process through once again. And so um, I'm just curious, though, you, you went through, you definitely came through that two years. So then now we're here. Now we're yeah. now we've moved to here, and you guys have formed a brand called Living Lucky. We have because it feels like our journey, and it feels like the more that we look at the things in our life that at the time we thought they were the worst things that ever happened to us, the times in our life that we thought were the darkest or the lowest or even those emotions that we sometimes don't want to feel. 
And I'm talking the emotions like fear, the emotions like regret, the emotions like the one shame, envy, guilt, shame, guilt. When I, um, I feel like those emotions are the ones that have taught me the most about myself. Those are the ones mm. that have built the most character. Those are the ones that have made me grow the most. It's because when I've been in those dark places, I learn, I grow, I find, I call it radical gratitude because when I really find gratitude in, in those mm, catastrophes, I find I catapult. That's what happens. And we call it spin positive, but it's, it's really, you know, there were, there were some times at the end of my radio career when I was, I was really feeling uneasy. And the more that I would try to go in and ask for a, for a promotion or ask for a raise and I was hearing no, 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 no. And I was getting really full of resentment and mm. anger. And it's, it's transmuting those emotions and feelings into power and into enlightenment and into right, using something it. that serves and into mm -hmm. something that can boost, boost Fuel. us up and impact the world, inspire. Does that right. make sense? Yes. You use it as fuel. You're using it as yes. fuel to move, to, to, to create a movement in, in that arena. And I mean, I think that's, that's amazing. And I love that you don't just, so you're in, you, you do have a disability and you're in the situation you're in, but you don't just talk to that. You talk to everybody who is willing to start a transformation. And I love also that you guys are doing this as a team because Jason also quit his job, his corporate job, not too long ago. How long has it been, Jason? September 3rd of last year. And, and that's the main thing is, we get in this complacency bubble. Jana and I were just talking about it earlier today. And when you're in that complacency bubble of good, good, and we've heard the saying that good is the enemy of great, but in that complacency bubble, sometimes mm -hmm. you forget to stay in that grateful mindset and to focus on the things that you have. And because that you can only build from what you have. And when you're complacent, you, you're kind of taking things for granted. You're, you're wanting more or, or you're not even wanting more, but you're not really being grateful for all the blessings and all the gifts that you have at hand and having a compelling future to build into. And that's really kind of the trap that we got stuck into. And we find that when we are supremely grateful or, or have radical gratitude, like Jana says, and we show up as our best selves, our most confident selves, that opportunities abound. The world is abundant. And we start believe the four pillars of living lucky are, are simple. It's believe in yourself, believe in the people around you, believe in your circumstances because we're not victims, and believe that a higher power is working through you and for you. So it's mm -hmm. and you're, the one truism in life is that there are going to be peaks and valleys. And it's just about remembering the tools that you have in your tool belt when you get to the valley. And how low do you want to go? How high do you want to bounce? I love it. I love it. All right, so you guys, um, you guys ready to, to talk to the audience a little bit? I of know course. That Deborah has raised her hand. Um, so you guys, uh, we're gonna open this up. If you want to come up and ask questions or uh, get involved in the conversation, um, we'd love to have you up here. Um, I'm gonna accept that. I think Sorry, I accepted that. There you go. Okay. So Deborah, what you got for us? I mean, go first ahead. of all, I apologize. I didn't realize I had my hand. Kind of... Sorry. First off, great to meet oh. you. Did not realize I had my hand raised. I apologize for that, but oh, it's I, okay. I, it looks it's like you good. had um, that little plus sign, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm like actually working on making my podcast cover right now for my upcoming podcast. But I did want awesome. to highlight something though that you 
two couple of things. I was commenting in the background a number of times because I can't tell you how many times I've asked Mm -hmm. what is wrong with you. And I get that from kids all the time. And I have a sarcastic response because I'm a native New Yorker. Sarcasm is just kind of our nature. (laughs) Now, mind you, I use a wheelchair for those that are listening. I have like full leg braces, back brace, neck braces, and a whole lot of internal hardware. So my knee-jerk reaction is to say, I'm a decommissioned cyborg. And then the parents kind of relax a little bit because their braces are mortified when the kids ask. But there was something that you said, and I think it is so important because this is something that I work on uh, quite a lot with people in the in the disability community is the disability dialogue and that self language, you know, uh, and not internalizing the what is wrong with you statement because, girl, I hear you. I have internalized that way more than I should have, and is actually why I'm doing the competition this year for the Miss Wheelchair for the Cal- Miss, Wheel- Miss Wheelchair USA competition because I was raised feeling like something. My, my parents didn't do; they didn't intend to. But rest of society did, whether intentionally or unintentionally, uh, judging or excluding or not including, especially socially, you know. Uh, and it was interesting because this weekend I went to the Abilities Expo, and girl, I have never been so nervous to walk out of it or wheel out whatever you want to call it, because I had the crown and sash, and I'm like, why is it I can publicly speak? But this I had an issue with, and it was because of all of that self language still of feeling lesser than or not beautiful or capable or anything like that. So uh, I heard that language and I'm like, oh yeah, I I understand that one really well. (laughs) And my son just walked in the room, which by the way, he did do adaptive sports with me. He played badminton. He's really good at adapt. He's not disabled, but he did get into a sports chair and play next to me. And uh, for those that are listening, Yes, you were better, but it's not really hard to be better than mommy. Um, that's yeah, yeah. my son in the background. And yes, there's a 10-second video on Instagram. And I'm like, yay! When I, uh, I wanted to highlight for a second, though, that adaptive sports are not easy, and I don't want anybody to think that they are. You know, And I know you didn't really go into that much detail of the talent that you have to have to be an Olympian, uh, an Paralympian or Olympian. It doesn't really matter either way because y'all kick butt, take names, and then some, and especially in adaptive sports because you have to have so much body control, so much trunk control, and so much mm-hmm. strength and balance, which I don't quite have. But I just, I really wanted to highlight that for a minute because that is so incredibly valuable. And uh, for parents, I can't tell you how much a freeing adaptive sports can be. And, you know, I'm nothing like a Paralympian or anything like that, but even adaptive skiing, or even now I have to use it route rig. I had to get those fixed out riggers on. But, you know, even that element of freedom of those moments where you can feel that quote unquote normal, which I don't like to use that word, but at least be able to be doing something with people that are able bodied and together as that family element is so vital. And, I didn't even know about adaptive sports until I was a junior in college when I transferred out to the U of A. And then I didn't even know that there was a thing of like wheelchair dancing. I was doing sitting dancing in my chair for like pretty much half my life, but I didn't know there was an actual thing called wheelchair dancing until I went to the Abilities Expo. And I was just, you know, highlighting these things because what becomes norm for some of the able-bodied people and things that we don't necessarily have access to or knowledge about often isn't shared with people in our communities and they can be so empowering. Mm -hmm. And then I I just really wanted to commend you too for that recognition of the mental wellness and mental health that goes along with these challenges, right? Because there is a loss, there is a grieving process. And for some of us, an ongoing grieving process of the life we thought we were going to have versus the life that we have, right? And yeah, you can hear this little bit of emotion of still working through some of those things. Uh, I wrote a chapter in the book in the fall, and I realized I hadn't quite finished grieving uh, some of those challenges. Like, okay, guess I got a little bit more work to do there. But <laughs> that concept. We're all a work in progress, right? We yeah, are. Absolutely. And I know as a person on stage, I'm going to hand it back to you in a second. I just, I really wanted to commend you for what you're doing, for being upfront, sharing it, not hiding it, but rather <laughs> applauding it. And more importantly, you said in the beginning, we all have a journey. We all have obstacles. Some of us have maybe a little bit more divots and 
switchbacks than intended or planned for. But we just keep rolling. Uh, yes, I see you say keep rolling forward. So uh, with that, I will pass the bike back to you. I love it. I love it, Jason. You got your hand raised. Yes, Jason. Mr. Mr. Yeah, Deborah. I just wanted to touch on something that Deborah had said, because when she said we all have obstacles, and that's so true. And one thing that you won't hear a lot of the, the people in the disability community talk about is the, what's it called? The, um, the hidden workload or, or the, what's it called? Invisibility. Invisible workload. And it takes so much to get to the starting line. But so many people, especially going through trauma or going through depression, going through anything that they're working through, that still also has its own invisible workload with it to get you to the starting line, to get you just out of bed, you know, to get to get in the shower, to, to brush your teeth. But it's, it's recognized, Deborah said, we're all on this journey together. And in the book of Solomon, it says there's nothing new under the sun. So it's just being patient and empathizing and, and Jana had mentioned listening, just being there and listening with an open heart and curiosity as opposed to judging people. And I think we, we a lot of times we get caught up in the judgment of our neighbor or comparisonitis with someone else's journey. And those are the things that start that negative self-talk that Deborah was talking about and Jana was talking about, and that will catch up with you before you're even aware of it. And so part of our, our platform is being aware of those emotions that self-talk and hearing the things that are happening between your ears so that you know, okay, I need to catch this. I need to start spinning it positive and start looking for the gratitude and building with the things that I have instead of comparing myself to someone else. So that, that's all I've got for that. Right. And that's like the third, the third step in, and what I use also in the keys to, you know, being feeling whole or, or at home within yourself is that self-talk. I mean, we all do it. It's a tool that we need to put into our toolbox so that we can learn to recognize it, be aware, interrupt it, and like you do, spin positive, flip it, turn it to the B side, whatever you have to do to create a new soundtrack. It's it's absolutely imperative for you to do that. Um, uh, the the real skinny is on stage with us right now, so take it away. Um, and let us know, Skinny, what you got to say on this topic, or if you have any questions for Jenna, Jason. Uh, actually, I, it, it was kind of neat that I came in when I did, and you guys were talking about these kind of things. And as far as uh, it, it relates to adaptive sports, um, I had a nephew who was involved in a car accident in his senior year of high school and uh, unfortunately was paralyzed from the waist down. And he was, you know, kind of like the captain of the basketball team, captain of the football team. He was very into sports and just and, – and he was actually on his way to becoming a soccer player for a major college when this happened. And so for a few years, he, you know, he was adjusting to, to life without the use of his legs and whatnot. And um, somebody had suggested adaptive sports just as an outlet for him, something he could still maybe do and be a part of. And, and, uh, his dad, of course, was a physical therapist and he got to talking to some people and, and I had a band at the time and we were doing a lot of fundraisers and things. And we all kind of just got together and started this adaptive sports thing and the turnout, we had people that turned out from States away, hundreds of miles away. And everybody chipped in and everybody started working together to make this thing happen. And that was the first time I'd even heard of adaptive sports. And just to see his eyes and his face, you know, when he got to do these things, it was, it was great. And um, it, it just changed his quality of life. And that's, that's one thing I loved about it is when, he, when we first started with the idea, he's like, I just, I don't know what I could do. I don't think I could do anything you know, and he just really beat himself up and, and he would try a little bit here and try a little bit there and quit. And uh, finally his dad took him out one day and, and got him on a sea do actually. And uh, mm -hmm. they had a special harness made for him somehow or another for it. And uh, he started doing that and just kind of took off on that. And then th that changed his whole mindset. And he was like, okay, now I want to see what else I can do. And so, <laughs> It was just, it was a really great thing to, to watch happen. So it was, it was that, nice to be a part of something like that too. 
Yeah. And I mean, that's yeah. awesome. Go ahead, Tana. Yeah. I just, I mean, whether you're disabled or not, I just find this is a, a good lesson for everybody. When you focus on what you can do instead of focusing on what you can't do, and also if you focus on what you can't do, instead of what you can't control, that's two things. And the third thing is ask yourself empowering questions instead of disempowering questions. So those are my three takeaways for this hour. Those three things, it. and that will help you spin positive. Awesome, love that. Jason, do you have any, any pointers that you wanna say before we close out? Cause I, I do wanna talk about what's going on in the fortune cookie. Do you have any uh, tips, tools that you wanna I think Jana summed it up very well. Perfect. Um, so uh, look, I'm gonna I want jump you... back down. Thank you for having me though. Appreciate uh, it. Oh, no Thank problem. You. Thanks for hopping up. Um, so uh, I want you guys to take a look at the fortune cookie. In there, I have a link um to my uh freebie for that i'm doing right now um a lot of times what what happens for us is and you'll see this even you'll see this even in the stuff we've talked about tonight that um you know the, the things that you do like when you come home and you quit your job <laughs> you know um it's because you need to create space for something new you need to create space and the space that you are trying to create is not just some physical space. It's m emotional and mental space that you need to be able to um, move into the next thing, to be able to be open for opportunities that you know are there for you. So this is just a little handout. It's a freebie. You guys can click on that. The other link that's in here is the Facebook page that Jason and Jana um, host. It's their group. It is called um, Spin Positive. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can join the group and be a part of uh, their inspiration. Uh, they do some coaching in there. There's a lot of stuff. Do you guys want to add a little bit? I don't know all. I know I'm in the group, but I don't want to speak for the group because you guys know the intention. Tell me, you know, if you have stuff you want to talk about for the group real quick. So we meet on Thursdays at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we offer 30 minutes of free coaching. Jason and I have, we have studied under so many mentors worldwide, and we take self-development not only as a hobby, but it is our passion, and this is our life. So we have decided We've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in learning and becoming masters of mindset. And we are offering to share what we've learned in our Thursday group for 30 minutes on Thursdays. And while I'm talking, I would also like to offer you a free gift if you would like it. It's my PDF that I use and it is my five questions that I use to start communicating with my soul. So I've been in the communication field for my entire life. I have learned how to communicate with audiences, with people around me, with relationships. But it wasn't until I started to learn to communicate with myself that my life has started to reach new levels. So if you'd like my free gift to you, you can text my name, J-A-N-A, -A, and you can text that to 66866. And that's my PDF. It's called Listen to You. And it is my system of my questions that I ask myself in a meditation of how you can start to really communicate with yourself and design a life of inspiration. Yeah, and the, and the Facebook group, Spin Positive, if you can't make it to the Thursday meetings, it's also just about having a community that's there lifting up and growing together. You know, the rising tide lifts all ships. So it's, it's about having 
it's building the right people around you and not not just um, scrolling through negativity on Facebook. So it's a great place. What's to the be. number again, Jana? It is six six eight six six. If you text the name Jana J A N A to six six eight six six, you will get my free PDF. All right, I just stuck that in there so people can see that real quick at the end of that scroll. Um, oh, thank you. Oh, no problem. So, um, I think I, I put it in there right. So, yeah, I keep getting invites to other shows that I got to keep going. No, no, go away. Um, so, listen, <laughs> I wanted to also shout out. I know at eight o'clock, so I'm sure they jumped from here. Um, Rocksteady is interviewing Wendy. Wendy was who I had on my last show. She was my first interview. Um, she is a fireside OG and she did an amazing, uh, interview with me. She helped me and she is also, um, I, I, just a very open and willing to support person. So, um, if you guys want you know, if you don't have someplace else to go or someplace else to be and you'd like to check in on these two, Rocksteady is from Australia. He's in Perth. These guys are going to have a whole lot of fun. Um, otherwise, stay tuned. Next week, I'm going to have Sam Toscano Watson, who is the better half. Sam, I am the better half of the married couple. She will be on here with me and we will be chatting. So until next time, I like to say I see you. You are beautiful. And we'll talk again. Thank you, Deanna. Uh, you're yeah. welcome. Thanks for coming up. i uh, see you guys later. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys.